Good afternoon. My name is Sarah Grant representing the city and county of Broomfield and I am the chair of the Dr. Cog Transportation Advisory Committee. I call to order the April 29th, 2024 Dr. Cog TAC meeting at 1.30 p.m. Thanks for everyone for being on time. This is an in-person live stream meeting format. Members of the public attending by Zoom have the ability to mute and unmute themselves and share their webcam. Those attending online, please make sure that you've typed your name and it reflects your first, last name and your representation. We ask that those attending to speak to use the raise hand button to ask a question or comment on an agenda item. If you have any technical questions, you can direct those to staff in the chat box. And again, please use the raise hand, uh, raise hand features to ask any questions or comment on an item. As a reminder to members and alternates here in person, please press the mute button, unmute button on the bottom of your mic stand and make sure the light on your microphone is on and you're prepared to speak. Please speak directly into the microphone so your voice will amplify and please announce your name and representation when asking a question or making a comment for the record. During the business agenda, TAC members and alternates can speak or ask questions. Members of the public may speak during those public comments. And Dr. Cog is now sending around the sign-in sheet. Please do sign in. And at this time, uh, TAC members and alternates in here in person will introduce themselves. We'll start with David Kretzinger. David Kretzinger, City and County of Denver. Brody Ayers, Aviation Special Interest. Carson Priest, TDM non-motorized. Brent Soderland, City of Littleton, representing Arapahoe County. Christina Lane, Jefferson County. Mike Whitaker, Jefferson County in Lakewood. Wally Work, Freight Special Interest. Larry Nimmo, County City of Castle Pines. Art Griffith, Douglas. John Ferruzzi, City of Arvada, representing Jeffco. Kent Mormon, City of Thornton, and Adams. Mike Allison, Rappo County, City of Good afternoon, Sean Poe, City of Commerce City, representing Adams County. Jeff Boyd, Housing Specialty Interest Seat. Michelle Riccio, Adams County. Von Sluder, uh, City of Lakewood. Pam Kennedy, Dr. Cox Staff. Sarah Grant, City and County of Broomfield. Jacob Rieger, Dr. Cog Staff. Ron Papsdorf, Dr. Cog. Jordan Rudel, alternate CDOT Region 1. Brad Rivera, non motorized special interest seat. Kevin Nash, Town of Frederick, Weld County. Marissa Gahan, CDOT Division of Transportation Development. Angie Rivera Malpietti, Equity Special Interest Seat. Bill Soroy, RTD. Jonathan Webster, City and County of Denver. Rick Pilgrim, Environmental Special Interest. Times the charm. Uh, Tom Moore with the uh, Denver Metro Regional Air Quality Council. Michelle Malanaka, City of Bol City of Lafayette, Boulder County. Austin Schmitz, uh, City of Lone Tree, Douglas County. And Sanson, City of Boulder. Lauren Curtis, Dr. Hogg Staff. Alex Hadright, Boulder County. Justin Bagley, City County of Denver. Great, thank you everybody. Um, I do not believe we have any updates from Dr. Cog, so I think we will uh, move right into public comment. We'll now open the meeting for public comment and public comment is limited to three minutes. You have joined by Zoom, please raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button and we'll call on you to begin speaking. If you join by phone, please raise your virtual hand by pressing star nine and we'll call on you by the last three digits of your phone number. Staff will unmute you and then you will need to unmute yourself by pressing star six on your phone. You'll have three minutes to speak, after which we'll ask you to wrap up your line and it'll be your, your line will be muted. And as a reminder, after the public comment period, only TAC members and alternates will be able to partake in the discussion regarding each agenda item. 
we have any public comment here in person? Do we have any public comment online? Thank you, Madam Chair. I do not see any hands raised at this time. Thank you. Uh, we'll now move on to the meeting summary portion of the agenda, uh, which is the March 25th, 2024 Transportation Advisory Committee meeting summary. If there's any discussion, corrections, or questions about the meeting summary, um, please let me know. I am seeing none from the TAC, and so the summary will stand as provided. Our first action item for today is uh, item number four in your packet, the 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan Amendment uh, recommendation. This is attachment B in your packet, and this will be presented by Alvin Badal Sanchez, Regional Transportation Planning Program Manager. Oh, now, there we go. Um, volume okay? Looks good. All right, thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, TAC members. Uh, my item before you is the amendments we've been undertaking to our 2050 Regional Transportation Plan. Um, I'll go over a quick update of what that process has looked like since we kicked this off back in September of last year, what those amendments were, um, the documents that are available before you for recommendation, and then uh, next steps. So we do have our amended 2050 main plan. Um, we also have a number of appendices that are being revised as part of this cycle amendment process. I'm highlighting two on this slide in addition to just our main plan. That's our Appendix S, which is our air quality conformity determination, and then Appendix T, which is our transportation greenhouse gas report, both of those um, responding to the various requirements we have through federal air quality conformity or the state's GHG planning standard. So both of these underwent an update to show compliance for both of these processes. Like I mentioned, we kicked this effort off in September of last year. Ultimately, by the time we wrap this up, we're looking at about a nine month long process. So we started with a call for amendments. Following that, we spent the last three months of 2023 um, working with project sponsors, talking to regional partners, modeling these projects um, to make sure by the first couple months of this year, we were able to develop our documents, make all those changes that are needed and get them ready for our public and stakeholder review pieces that are part of our process. So March through April is really when we held our public and stakeholder review period. That included our 30 days of public review, our public hearings that are required through our process, as well as reviews that are needed by the Transportation Commission and the Air Pollution Control Division. We are now before y'all for the beginning of our recommendation process. Um, following RTC recommendation and board adoption in May as planned, um, we anticipate completing this, wrapping up all of our efforts, submitting to our federal partners, making sure these documents are accessible by state standards um, by J July 1. So a nine month long effort to update our plan. There are five amendments that are part of this cycle amendment process. Uh, 96th Avenue, Colorado 7, Havana Street at Lincoln Avenue, I-76 at Weld County Road 8, and Vasquez at 60th. Um, we received seven during the call for amendments. We found one um, didn't need to be shown in our plan, so it wasn't eligible uh, for an amendment. And then one, after working with the project sponsor, we determined would be a better fit to handle during our major four-year update to make sure we had a holistic view of what that corridor needed to look like in the community. So these are the five that have been processed in our cycle amendment process. Um, they are across the region um, and multiple project types. Uh, one of them, the Vasquez and 60th project, is an existing project that has been revised to move forward in the plan for an earlier implementation. A key piece of this effort has been relying on the GHG framework that we developed back in 2022 to continue to meet our GHG emission reduction requirements. That piece has not changed since the, all the work we did back in 2022 to meet the GHG planning standard emission reduction requirements. So we have carried forward all of those strategies, those major project changes, the mitigation measures have all moved forward into this update unchanged. With that, we do meet our emission reduction requirements across each of the four analysis years that we have to show compliance for. 
Um, we first do take our modeling to see what emission reduction we can achieve through the project investment mix in the plan. Um, and then the off-model calculations and the mitigation action plan rows are carried forward unchanged from the 2022 plan. So we did not edit those at all during this effort. It has just been making sure that the projects that are in our plan in our model reflect the amendments that we are processing. So looking at each of those four analysis years, the greenhouse gas reductions achieved in each of those four, we do exceed our emission reduction requirements per table one of the rule. And the second part of uh, this regional analysis I'll touch on is our air quality conformity work. So through our um, status as non-attainment, we do have to make sure we're addressing ozone pollutants in our plan. Uh, just as with the GHG work, the conformity is regional in nature, so we're not basing that on individual projects. Um, but those projects are in our regional travel model in our transportation networks. Um, and then just as with the GHG emission reduction requirements, we do pass our pollutant emission tests for air quality conformity. Um, in comparison to GHG emission reduction requirements, which are from a baseline, uh, air quality conformity is um, to a budget, so we can't exceed that budget that's shown on that first row. So for the four analysis years that we have modeled, we don't exceed um, any of those budgets over the next, those four analysis years for either of those two compounds that make up ozone. So we pass our tests for regional air quality conformity. So as part of a cycle amendment process, we do our routine updates to our plan document. That includes making sure the maps are updated. We have all those projects that are, we're processing. I'm showing those reflected appropriately in the plan. Uh, when we do open up our plan for cycle amendments, we also have to do some minor updates to a number of appendices. That could be our financial plan, assuming we're making any financial um, assumption changes. Uh, the performance measures that we're tracking as one of our appendices gets updated as part of that. Uh, and then the two that I've highlighted throughout this presentation doing our updates to our air quality conformity documents and our greenhouse transportation report. So we held a 30-day public review period. We developed a social pinpoint engagement site. Uh, so that was where we put all of our documentation during this effort, the main plan, all 1920 appendices, as well as a concurrent effort that we were working on through Metro Vision. Um, this site was a one-stop shop for members of the public, stakeholders to go um, review all those plans and then learn instructions on how to engage with us um, provide comments. There was a discussion board option as well as our standard uh, email, our public engagement planner. Uh, and then we capped off that public review period with a hybrid public hearing on April 17th before our board of directors. Just a quick snapshot of some promotion examples that we did to highlight that this plan was available for comment, what we were amending. So we did share an e-blast announcing that 30-day public review period, and then our social media team uh, promoted the review period a number of times over that 30-day review. quick highlights of what we saw when we uh, looked at the different metrics that we had related to engagements. We did have our one public hearing. Um, there were 10 comments on the draft plan, uh, staff comments, and then just looking at some of the e-blast metrics that we tracked, that 42% open rate at the bottom right is uh, pretty on par in line with some of our other open rates that we've had for other e-blast promotional materials that we've done for other plans here at Dr. Dog. And ultimately, we did receive 150 visits to that social pinpoint online engagement hub. that, uh, we do have a proposed motion before y'all, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Alvin. Are there any questions or comments for Dr. Cobb? Yes, Ms. Andrea Rivera Malpietti. Thank you. Um, first, I want to thank you for this presentation, because I thought it was really very well done. I do have a couple of questions in terms of community outreach in languages, because Reading all of this stuff, I, I wasn't seeing any diversity in the languages, particularly in the Commerce City area and the Latino community. I'm wondering if you can tell me, like, the one public hearing, where was it held and how were people notified about it? And then out of all the comments that you've received, how many of them are from communities of diversity? So the one public hearing we held was hybrid, so the folk had the option of either coming um, to this very space and speaking before the board or speaking uh, virtually. Um, that was April 17th in the evening hours, our typical board of directors meeting. Uh, we received 10 comments, all were from staff from RTD, uh, so there weren't any community or uh, additional stakeholder comments from uh, a different community or a different language group. 
Um, we do provide some of the material in Spanish, um, our executive summary, uh, and then the Social Pinpoint site does allow folk to translate the, all the materials, um, all the content that's visible into a language other than English. So that was one way that we were um, making materials available in a language other than English. I'm sorry, how, how are you getting the information out to communities in different languages? Uh, our e-blast was primarily in English and the, so were the social media posts. Um, the, the social pinpoint sign is available and can be made in a language other than English, but there weren't any dedicated uh, promotional campaigns for this cycle in a language other than English. Um, since this was a more typical cycle known process, we didn't undertake a larger effort back in 2022 when we were doing um, a much longer, almost year-long effort to update the plan to meet GHG compliance. We did do a public hearing um, that provided both American Sign Language and Spanish interpretation live for uh, attendees. We also held five public meetings at that time, um, and two provided live Spanish uh, Spanish interpretation at those as well. So um, because this was a, a cycle amendment, uh, we were just making some targeted revisions to projects, our more inclusive, uh, diverse um, engagement was back in 2022 when we were doing a, a much larger overhaul to the plan and doing, um, touching a lot more pieces in the plan. Rick Pelgrim. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Um, Evelyn Bidal, the, it, this actually is not a question related to the greenhouse gases. It's I, I seem to remember that we were struggling a couple of years ago with particulate compliance. Um, are we are we still out of compliance with particulates, or we're we're now fine with that? We're good across the board with HG ozone particulates. Yes, that's correct. Uh, for air regional air quality conformity, we only have to show um, conformity for ozone now. So the two precursors, um, we don't do conformity for uh, particulate matter or Carbon, carbon, second word, yes, thank you. Well, uh, great job, congratulations. Any additional questions or comments for Dr. Cogstaff? Go ahead. Thanks for a nice presentation. Um, what's the cycle time on this if, if there was a new conformity analysis required because there's more air quality plans being developed. Do you return to this and update it or? Yep, so we update the plan every four years. Uh, so we anticipate kicking off that next major update uh, late this summer. Ultimately, uh, we'll be looking to have that all wrapped up by winter of 2026. So that'll be our next major update to this plan where we, we do our air quality conformity, our greenhouse gas work, and a lot of other pieces that make up our, our plan. Thank you. Any additional questions or comments? I also have a proposed motion. Kent Mormon. I move to recommend to the Regional Transportation Committee the draft 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan associated southern sub area eight hour ozone conformity determination and greenhouse gas. Report. Thank you, Kent. And I think we have a second from David Kretzinger. Second. Any uh, discussion? On Pabstorf. Just, just wanted for the information for the committee, did also want to say that under the greenhouse gas transportation planning rule requirement through CDOT, um, that our staff did take the greenhouse gas transportation report, presented that to the Colorado Transportation Commission two weeks ago, last week, and the commission accepted that report. So did want to just get that on the record for the committee's now. And Thank you for that update. Any additional discussion? A motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Extensions? Motion carries. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. So now we will move on to um, our second action item, which is item number five in your packet. This is attachment C, the 2024 to 2027 Transportation Improvement Program Policy Amendments. 
and I'll hand it over to Josh Wank, Senior Planner. All right, thank you, Chair Grant. Um, I do have three proposed changes to projects listed in our Transportation Improvement Program for the committee uh, this afternoon. The first is to add $8 million in federal bridge on system funds to the Region 1 BRO pool. Um, that funding is all going towards essential culvert repairs. The second would be adding over $18 million to RTD's bus and bus facilities pro, uh, project. Um, this is all prior year funding, which was um, incorrectly omitted from the current TIP during the transfer from the previous TIP to the current one. So we are simply uh, correcting that. Um, and the third would be to add over $126 million in federal capital investment grant funds, which were recently awarded to the East Colfax BRT project. Uh, happy to take any questions on any of those. Um, otherwise, I do have a proposed recommendation, or excuse me, a recommended motion available for you in your packets. Thank you, Josh. Any questions or comments for Dr. Cobb? Sorry, someone have their hand raised? Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Tom Moore. Uh, Josh, thanks. Um, Tom Moore with the Regional Air Quality Council. Um, I looked at your timeline on pages 17 and 18 for the conformity analysis. So, um, the last date is updated. The plan was considered by the air quality control. Is the conformity analysis that you're reporting from that plan? Um, so our conformity analysis is actually done as part of the regional transportation plan. So the um, prior uh, presentation, our transportation improvement program has to be in compliance with the regional transportation plan. So that conformity analysis that is associated with the RTP is applied to the TIP as there cannot be any projects uh, included within the TIP that did not previously, uh, were not previously included within the RTP. Okay, well, maybe I should take this offline, but I'm asking a different question. Like, what is the conformity compliance that you're reporting, even though it comes from this other plan? Does that reflect the decisions made by the Air Quality Control Commission in 2022? Um, I might lean on Jacob. Yep. Jacob Breaker? Yeah, let, me... let me try to answer that. So, short answer is yes, it does. So, just to be clear, Whenever, whenever um, RAC and the Air Quality Control Commission adopt a new state implementation plan for air quality, which is where our budgets come from that we need to meet, um, our air quality conformity budgets that we need to meet under federal law through the regional transportation plan, whenever a new state implementation plan for air quality or a SIP is developed, then the subsequent plan, whenever it is the next time that we do a plan, implements what is then the current SIP budget for our uh, criteria pollutants. Um, so that was the previous item. And then the TIP, as Josh said, um, under federal law, the TIP implements the plan. So the TIP uses the plan's air quality conformity analysis. So Tom, to your point, whenever a new state implementation plan for air quality is developed, the next plan, the next sort of cycle in what I just described is when that is implemented on our end. Does that make sense? Sure, the process makes sense. I, I'm, it was just, I read this section of the report that he just talked about, and it's, it's just not really clear which of the many SIPs <laughs> that have been cycled through in the last few years these data are coming from. So maybe that's just a clarification that I can follow up offline on. Sure. Tom, any additional uh, questions or comments for Dr. Cox's staff? We have a proposed um, recommendation. Proposed. Improvement Program. Thank you. Can you please state your name for the record? Oh, Larry Nimmo. Thank you. Thank you for the proposed motion. Sean Poe will second that. Thank you, Sean Poe. Um, any further discussion? 
All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries, and I'll also mention uh, congratulations to Denver for that significant capital investment grant. Congrats. Okay, we'll move on to item 5.1. This is in your amended agenda. This is the 2024 to 2025 Unified Planning Work Program Amendment, attachment I in your packet. Um, again, Josh Wink, Senior Planner. Thank you again, Chair. Um, so just as a refresher for uh, folks on the committee or those who may be new, um, our Unified Planning Work Program is the document wherein we list all of the work tasks that staff are anticipated to work on over a two-year period in our function as the Metropolitan Planning Organization for the Denver region. Um, so the change proposed to the UPWP here today is primarily associated with the closeout of our previous uh, consolidated planning grant, uh, which covered 2022 to 2023, and rolling that funding over into our current UPWP grant, which covers 2024 to 2025. So we've updated tables seven through 10 in the back of the document to account for that funding. Um, as part of that, since we're already bringing forward the amendment for the funding change, we also circulated the document uh, to staff to see if there were any changes that needed to be made as we are now close to a year into the document. Um, the majority of changes are simple textual clarifications. Uh, we did have two new deliverables added, a TDM incentives white paper, as well as a quick, excuse me, quick build toolkit, toolkit associated with our Vision Zero program. Um, we've also just uh, placed the document into our new uh, accessibility format to meet state accessibility standards. So happy to answer any questions associated with this document or the amendment to it. Um, otherwise, I do have a proposed motion for you in your packet on this as well. Josh, any questions or comments for Dr. Cogstaff on the amendments? None. I think that the amendments make a lot of sense, and thank you for bringing these forward for uh, for the TAC recommendation. Uh, do we have a rec we have a recommended motion? Kent Mormon. I'm Kent Mormon, City of Thornton, Adams County. I move to recommend to the Regional Transportation Committee the amendment to the fiscal year 2024-2025 Unified Planning Work Program for the Denver region. That's all right. No, I'll second. Bill, we have a motion and a second. Um, any further discussion on this item? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. And that concludes the action items uh, for today's agenda. Uh, next on, uh, next up are discussion items, and this is item number six in your packet, the non-discrimination program update, attachment D, and we'll hand it back to Alvin Badal Sanchez, Regional Transportation Planning Program Manager for this topic. Thank you again, Chair. Um, I am um, also have my colleague here, Cole Nieder, who is available for any questions. He's been leading one of the plan updates that I'll be discussing here during this item, but this is related to our non-discrimination program. That's one of the other plans uh, that my team handles here at Dr. Cog in coordination with other divisions, teams here at the agency. Um, we do this update every three years, so just part of our requirements as a designated recipient for Federal Transit Administration funds. I'll touch on each of the uh, three existing plans, the Title VI Implementation Plan, the Limited English Proficiency Plan, the Americans with Disabilities Act Program Access Plan, the new plan that we're developing, the Disadvantaged Business Enterprise Program Plan, um, and then highlight what we're looking at updating in each of these three, what the fourth one will contain, and then end with where we are and where we're looking to go in the, the next year. Start with our Title VI implementation plan. It's our most expansive here at the agency. It documents all the different ways, all the different policies, procedures, resources that we have available to make sure that we're providing our services, activities um, in a non 
discriminatory, accessible manner. Um, because we do the, do this every three years, this update will look back at the last three and look at the different uh, major plans and programs that we completed uh, and how we did those in an accessible manner over the last three years. And then it's another way that uh, members of the public um, and our, our recipients can look at what our process is for reviewing our plans, our programs, our projects, and making sure we're being as inclusive and accessible as possible when developing them. There are two key pieces of our Title VI implementation plan. The first is a demographic profile of the Denver region. And so we do provide a map showing the distribution of different communities, um, indicators from the census that have historically been linked to marginalization in the region nationally. And then the second piece, uh, we take that demographic analysis and then we overlay our most recent transportation improvement program investments. Uh, and we overlay that on, on the area to see, make sure that uh, investments that are occurring in the region are occurring um, equally, equitably um, across the region. So any benefits, any burdens that are potentially occurring with those projects are being shared across the region, not disproportionately impacted any particular community across the region. Like I mentioned, it's our most expansive. So in addition to those two key pieces, we also do just outline all the different policies we have in place, our different notices, our different procedures um, that are available to staff, to recipients uh, related to non-discrimination. We outline our board and committee structure. How do we make decisions here at Dr. Cog? How is that accessible, inclusive, non-discriminatory? We go over what we do as an agency, all the different work plans we have, the different teams, the different divisions. What are those major projects, programs that we're working on con continuously, and how are we doing that accessibly? A uh, new piece that we had last cycle is subrecipient monitoring. That was a result of our recent, at the time, um, status as a designated recipient of 5310 funds. Um, now that uh, we're a couple years into that, we'll update that section just to meet some of the pieces that we're doing here at the agency. We discuss the data that we have available to us as staff to use in um, developing our plans, our programs, making equitable decisions, and then outline our public participation process. How are we ensuring folks throughout the region are able to engage with us in ways that make sense and are best for them? The second plan is the limited English proficiency plan, making sure folk all across the region can participate in our activities to uh, the fullest extent practicable. So uh, through this plan, we identify what language assistance we can provide, um, what's the staff training we have available, how do we let folk in the region know that this assistance is available. So this meets our English proficiency requirements through our, through, um, through our federal and state requirements. Just as the Title VI plan has a demographic analysis, the limited English proficiency plan has a limited English proficiency assessment for the region. This has historically, historically included a map of that distribution across the region. Um, historically, the top 10 languages spoken that were other than English in the region, county level breakdowns, um, school district language use, so trying to provide a resource for staff uh, as well as the region um, to help better understand language use in the Denver region. This one's predicated on a four-factor analysis that we do. Um, factor one, figuring out the number or proportion of persons with limited English proficiency that um, we might encounter in a particular program, uh, the frequency with which they're gonna come into contact with that program, how important is what we're talking about to individual recipients' lives, and then the fourth, uh, taking into account what's available to us, what resources we have, what's the cost for providing all of these different plans, programs, activities, services, and languages other than English, recognizing we don't have the resources to provide everything in every language that might be spoken in the region. How do we prioritize that as an agency? And our last existing plan is the Americans with Disabilities Act Program Access Plan, outlining our requirements under the ADA and the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, um, and just talks about all the different ways that we're accessible um, for folk with different disabilities in the region and engaging with us um, and accessing our services. So this one includes uh, other topics as well. It includes our office space. Um, while we don't own the building, we are tenants, so making sure our office space is accessible, compliant with the ADA. What are we doing on our website to make sure folk with different disabilities, um, different needs are able to access the information on our website? Uh, when do we hold public meetings? How do we hold public meetings? Are they in accessible facilities? Are they at accessible times? Um, can you get there multiple different ways? Uh, touching on our planning process, all the different ways that we make decisions here at Dr. Cog, how are we making sure those are accessible? And then just as Title VI had a piece on subrecipient monitoring, also making sure our subrecipients are compliant with the Americans with Disabilities Act as well. 
And then the last plan I'll touch on is new for us as an agency. So this would be a disadvantaged business enterprise program plan. It would specifically only apply to our 5310 funding that we received through the FTA. So that's uh, just coming out of our designated recipient status for those funds, uh, because we do anticipate issuing contracts to ourselves or subrecipients greater than $250,000. Uh, we're required to have this in place. And so we're taking efforts now with our administration and finance staff um, and other teams at the agency to determine what that plan looks like for us. Uh, we do already include a DBE information request form in all of the different bids and solicitations that we put out. So um, we already do some of this work. We're formalizing this into a new program plan and potentially enhancing that form and the different clauses that we have as part of our contracts. So the scope of the update across the three existing plans for our Title VI implementation plan, we're looking at updating that demographic profile. Uh, in the current plan, it uses what we call our vulnerable populations data set. That's seven different indicators in the region, um, people of color, low income, disability status, LEP status. We're looking at updating that with our new marginalized communities data set. That's 10 indicators that came out of our equity index work that we were working on um, over the last two years, wrapped up last year. And so we wanna utilize that new data set as well as a new equity index that we have available to us as staff that was also developed as part of that process. With that, we want to update our investment analysis just using those new demographic definitions, um, bringing forward the analysis that was done in the last transportation improvement program around the equity index, the benefits burdens analysis, being able to talk more about what are some potential benefits and potential burdens with projects across the region. When it comes to our limited English proficiency plan, we're really just looking at updating the data that underlies that, so not a major overhaul to any pieces of that. Uh, but we do also want to reflect a couple new procedures we have in place here at Dr. Cog. So there is a translation policy now. Um, we do do annual trainings for staff, so just reflecting that in our plan. And then for the ADA program access plan, we've been doing a lot of work around the state's accessibility requirements. We want to formalize that, um, reflect that in our ADA program access plan. So what are the new resources we have available to staff, the new platforms, what are the new procedures we have? Um, how are we ensuring that all of our various documents, web products are accessible per the state's new requirements? So a tentative schedule that we're looking out, um, we've been updating our equity index just based on what we learned last year with the TIP analysis. Um, how do we want to change that index, make some tweaks to it? Um, we've been updating the content in the plan, the three individual plans writing that content for the new plan. So we're hoping to finalize that in May. Uh, public review would span June to July. Ultimately, we would come back to TAC for a recommendation in August, um, RTC and board in September. Ultimately, we're aiming for a federal deadline of October 1st to have these three plans, the fourth plan, our program in place by that October 1st deadline. That concludes my presentation, Chair. Um, myself and Cole are available for any questions y'all might have. Thank you, Alvin. Thank you for that program update. Um, are there any questions or comments for Dr. Cog's staff? Kent Mormon. Thank you, Alvin. Um, Kent Mormon with the uh, City of Thornton in Adams County. Question um, on the, um, I think it was back a slide or so, but uh, Dr. Cog procedures for outreach for uh, LEP. Um, what what are you thinking on pro new procedures? I guess um, it might be a benefit to the whole region as we have these public meetings and we're using Dr. Cog funds or funds or federal funds. There's a standardized method that you're using or, or to know. That's a separate presentation in and of itself, but uh, was just curious what additional procedure you're talking about. Yeah, that's really around the translation policy that we rolled out at the agency, determining what um, products uh, would have translation as part of them, either like executive summaries, um, social media campaigns, if you're doing videos, when are you wanting to translate those? Uh, so that those new procedures really are just try to reflect some practice here at the agency over the last couple of years. Um, what does it mean when you want to translate an executive summary into Spanish? Um, there's a lot more work on everyone's end to actually get to that, that end point, so making sure staff are uh, well aware of those procedures. So it's more just uh, uh, capture what, what's practice here at the agency. But as part of the LEP plan, we do provide some resources. Um, really is just the I speak cards that come from the, the U.S. Census. So that's a, a resource we make available through, through the plan and on our website that's just more general. Go ahead, Kent. Um, so when you're showing these tracks, there, or you're showing these are census tracks in the maps, correct? Or are yes, they I, some I, other zone? I, I believe we use census tracks at this point in the, 
Uh, Take a breather. Yeah, just wanted to <clears throat> add to Alvin's excellent response. Just for general information, we are required under federal law, we would do it anyway, but we have a public engagement plan on our website. And the way that particular plan is structured is actually is a little bit of a toolkit. Um, so both, both for ourselves, but for the region as well, to Ken's point, you know, we're trying to do this kind of activity or we have this kind of thing that we're trying to undertake. And what are the methods and the techniques and the people we're trying to reach? And, you know, what are some ways, some strategies that we can do that? So it's actually a pretty useful resource for us and would be for the region as well. Um, again, it's on our website, so it's publicly available. And then as part of some current work that we're doing through our corridor and community planning, uh, we're also pioneering some... Um, some innovative and, and I think creative public engagement techniques in coordination with CDOT and Federal Highway Administration. We're trying um, some things, some, excuse me, we are trying some techniques out related specifically to um, underserved populations um, and other things that we can do to sort of bring some folks into the fold um, in some of our events. And so we're, we're piloting those now and then we'll report on them later. But um, again, all of that's available as a resource. Thank you, Rivera Malpieri. Thank you. Um, so I guess this is part of my too, is um, talking about outline on how individuals who may need land are identified. Talk a little bit more about what kind of techniques you can in terms of incorporating outreach to that don't speak. Yeah, so I would say the first step it, that we've done is just mapping out those communities. And um, we recognize that a census tract level, that can get pretty difficult once you get outside of the, the central core, but at least understanding at a baseline where those different communities might live, um, what are the languages that are being used in the region. Um, the current iteration of the plan does include distribution uh, by the top five languages in the region. So we're able to at least see some granularity at the regional level for different the different five languages. Um, I had a second point, and now I've lost it. Uh, give me 10. Oh, um, Dr. Cog has many different hats in the region as well, so we also rely on our area agency on aging staff. Um, they have a, a refugee older adults program, so they have a lot more lived experience with folk in the region, and so we're able to lean on them for um, maybe you're not hearing Spanish all that often. What are the other language that, languages that you're hearing? Um, if we're going into particular communities, how do we, how do we leverage um, their expertise? And then through uh, Jacob's earlier point about the community-based transportation corridor planning work, we've also worked with local nonprofits in the area who have a much better understanding of their communities and expertise in those spaces, so um, trust in those communities that we can leverage for our planning products and I rely on them to tell us what's the, the best method, medium, language, um, how should we be engaging with those communities. Additional questions or comments for Dr. Cog's staff? I just wanted to mention that I really appreciate the work uh, Dr. Cog has done with the equity index map. I found it to be a very informative tool that we use it for our day-to-day -day planning purposes. So really looking forward to um, this program update and a future update from staff on this program. Any additional comments or questions? Okay. Thank you, Alvin. Thank appreciate you. it. Item number seven, um, discussion item around the regional crash data consortium update. And this is attachment E in your packet. And I'll hand it over to Eric Brighton, crash data consortium senior planner. All right, thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Eric Brighton. As just mentioned, I'm the senior planner for our regional crash data consortium. My role really has been to help to coordinate this group working towards improving trash data collection processing analysis. I am probably mainly an update on the work we've done, but recognizing that we do have some folks who have joined the committee since the last time I presented, I want to give a really brief primer on the grant um, structure and the primary goals are. So after Chicago received a 405C traffic record improvement grant um, in years 2023, federal fiscal years 2023 and 2024 from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Um, in a program that is administered by the Colorado Department of Transportation. Um, primary goals of our grant has really been to investigate and demonstrate the value of regional crash consortium to inventory the needs of the region, um, which has been done. 
um, and continue to work to identify and address common issues with crash data collection, processing, and analysis. Kicked off this project in, in October of 2022 um, with a number of a survey that went out to members of different committees and different groups um, in Dr. Kai region. Um, with that, we planned a meeting um, in November where we brought stakeholders together, um, to get a preliminary kickoff for the group, and introduced the concept um, and invited many more opportunities for engagement. Over the next several months, we held over 45 to 50 interviews with stakeholders across the region um, and at the state and federal level, which informed our need inventory and needs assessments. And we presented these for public re review of the group and for commentary from stakeholder members in September of 2028, or September of 20, 20, September 28th, um, 2023. We at this meeting, we solicited feedback from stakeholders um, in the format of a workshop and provided that as a, a public comment period for stakeholders um, to provide comments on the documents. And with those, we did some changes to the inventory and the needs assessment to reflect some of these recommendations. And those were published and sent out to stakeholders in March of this year, um, as well as a preview of it at our September 29th meeting. We had some representatives from the Colorado Department of Transportation and Department of Public Health and Environment who spoke on some of the data tools that they're using and some of the updates that are being done at the state level. Right now, we are in this phase of developing, implement, yeah, developing and implementing solutions. And so with that, we are really looking at the needs that have been developed through the stakeholder engagement. The original document has a number of potential strategies resources and potentially and barriers that we've identified. And we're working on really digging into those and looking at some of the cross connections between these. We are planning to have a few more meetings of this group, um, dates to be determined, but we're looking at June for the next one. And as soon as we have a date, we'll provide that to the stakeholders in this group. Um, and we are planning to have a final meeting of in this grant cycle or grant period in September of this year. We'll, we'll be completing, we we'll come compiling a end of year survey that we'll distribute to stakeholders, as well as formatting a final report, which will document what we've learned, some recommendations and strategies to go forward. Brief recap of our inventory. We included a section that really detailed a lot of the data sources that we heard from stakeholders are being used. One, I think really interesting thing that I learned from this is that pretty much everyone we talked to, every organization we talked to, are using multiple sources of data. CDOT um, data was one of the most highly um, rated ones and re referenced, but many, many municipalities are maybe using their local law enforcement data. They're using CDOT data for certain things. They're using our data here at Dr. Cog for certain things. And so one thing we heard very often and often was that there's different sources. Some of them are in conflict. Some are, are, have different use, use cases over others. And so that's one thing that we really wanted to learn more about. Analysis goals and use cases was another big topic we wanted to learn about. Um, many of the stakeholders talked, um, as may be expected, about trying to learn about safety, screening for correctable patterns in the roadway systems. Um, we also heard a lot about the, some of the factors in the crash report, such as the movements of the vehicles, such as the driver actions, driver behaviors, things of that nature were also high, of a high interest to many stakeholders, um, as well as highlight on some of the components in the report, including a narrative section, which law enforcement can fill out to kind of detail what's going on or what their understanding of the mechanics of a crash were. Um, diagrams uh, which, uh, was something that was cited as something useful by some stakeholders. And other, um, other just ge um, geospatial information systems technologies that are desired um, by some of our partners. One big thing we focused on trying to understand from our stakeholders was issues and challenges that they're experiencing. Um, one of the top ones we consistently heard was about location accuracy and availability. Um, we heard that from pretty much all levels insofar as there's some, some, some cities have really great access some to highly, highly accurate geocoded data. Others have, have, they may have nothing or they may be relying um, directly on Dr. Cog for that support or their county. And so we're looking at trying to level that playing field and make sure that everyone has accurate data for their analysis. Timeliness of data was another huge concern. Uh, we heard time and time again that the data, official data coming out from CDOT is very delayed for the analysis that our stakeholders wanted to use. So that's something that we're interested in. The reporting inconsistency, um, just different, there's, in the, in, the Den, in the Denver region, there are 48 law enforcement agencies, um, including the Colorado State Patrol. 
uh, these different, they use different software to collect reports, they have different processes. Um, there's this one standard form, but different ways of filling it out. And so that leads to discrepancies. Accessibility of data is a concern that we've heard. We've heard from some planners, some engineers saying, we know there's data out there, but we don't know where to get it. We don't know how to use it. And so we're hoping to, again, kind of level that playing field, make sure it's useful for everybody who wants to use this data set. Discrepancies between data sets is something we heard where maybe a municipality has a certain number of crashes in their system and what's reflected in CDOT system or in our data, which is based off CDOT, is different. Um, that's something we want to try to you know, handle on so everyone's on the same page. And the integration of data, there's all sorts of other great data sets out there and public health realm, um, in citations, in adjudications, which some stakeholders have expressed interest in or have more access to than others based on their relationships. And so that's something that we think that is something that can help improve how we understand crashes going forward. And with relevant information, just kind of a catch-all we had in our grants language written in. I think the most important thing for here that I learned was really about the, the relationship between law enforcement and other stakeholders. There's, there's huge differences in how municipalities and that counties, um, other agencies work with their law enforcement. Some I've heard have great relationships where they can just send an email or call someone or head down to their office, get what they need. Others, I, I heard from one that they even needed to do a, a, a CORA, um, Colorado Open Records Act, um, Act to get data. And so it's not great, <laughs> uh, potentially, but things I think we can improve. Based off of this inventory, uh, we developed a needs assessment, which really documents 17 needs, some of those um, structural to the consortium, looked at priority prioritization of these, again, based off of the feedback we received in September and October from the consortium stakeholders. And we've, we've identified several strategies, resources, and barriers for the needs. I'm not going to go over these individually, but I'm just kind of listing these out here, and they should be in the packet for review. Um, but as everyone can see from looking at this, what we have as high needs often are things coming around the geospatial, the elements of it, the timeliness, and the quality. And one thing about this that I just want to highlight is many of these kind of have inter interrelations, interdependencies between each other. This is one thing that we're going to try to elucidate in our final report and through the next few months of this work, because the way that I see it, the way of, um, what I understand from in conversations with, with y'all, people in this group and, and the rest of the consortium, things such as if we improve the number, increase the number of records that have the geospatial coordinates in the first place, that can make, that can lead to having a better access to that. If we, improve, if we are trying to get more timely data, but data has been rejected by the Colorado Department of Revenue and sent back to law enforcement, improving the completeness of reports in the beginning of the process can ideally lead to a delay or lead to uh, a decrease in needing to send reports back. So there's in the interdependencies between some of these elements that we're looking to really explore in the next iteration of the project. So just a list of the, the remaining needs here. Um, again, some of these are capacity-wise, um, re recognizing the need that even though we've spoken to, again, over over 50 organizations, total number of people who have had any contact with the consortium in this effort has been about 125, 130. But there's all different levels. That's planners, that's engineers, that's law enforcement, that's public health. And really, I think that we are, we've done a really great job and really appreciate the support of people who have um, spoken with me in this process. But I think that we still need to, uh, there's some work to be done to bring in some more voices in the conversation. The ongoing work we're doing, and again, what we're really hoping to bring out over the next several months towards the end of our project in this project in September at, under the current grant is really working to develop specific outcomes, recommendations, next steps based off of these needs. I'm continuing to work with different organizations such as the Statewide Traffic Records Advisory Committee. Um, they have a subcommittee, this crash, crash manual task force, which is tasked with trying to improve the manual that law enforcement uses and the training of law enforcement. Um, we're not able to do really anything to change the crash report form at this time. There was a big process in 2019 uh, that finished in 2019, took several years. So that is kind of set, but we're looking for ways that we can improve how it's interacted with by those collecting the data. Working to refine this consortium structure and roles. Um, we've had, a, again, a lot of conversations. We've had a lot of um, great meetings where we've had stakeholders from the regions, on the state, come in, present, share information. And I've, I've learned a lot. I hope that people who have come to our meetings have learned a lot. Um, but I think we're really looking to see how we can take this to the next level and kind of coalesce around some of these needs and kind of move the, on, move the needle on um, making some improvements to the crash data. As mentioned, we'll be doing end-of-year survey. The structure of that is not quite figured out yet, um, but it's something that we're planning to do through our grants. 
And finally, just pulling through the final report with these recommendations, outcomes, next steps, needs assessments, needs out, needs um, inventory, and packaging it all up in a way that is useful for all of you all working in this world and our stakeholders for traffic safety. With that, um, if anyone has any questions, I am happy to, to address them. Thank you, Eric. Thank you for the update on the consortium's work. Um, Jacob Reaper. Yeah, thank you, Chair Grant. Um, just a couple of things to add on to Eric's presentation. First, I want to thank Eric in particular. This is a grant-funded project. It's really specialized work. We have not done anything of this scale and this depth in this region before. So I tell Eric every day he's on the job he's doing, you know, he's plowing new ground because uh, we haven't done this before. And the same to all of you who I know many of you have participated in our regional crash data consortium meetings. You all are welcome. So if you've not participated yet, you still have an opportunity. But um, as Eric alluded to, we've had, what, 60, 70 folks per meeting, um, different agencies. So we've gotten a lot of interest. Uh, we're really gratified by that. Just real quick before we get into questions, don't be shy. How many folks know that we geocode non-CDOT crash data? Well, that makes the second question mute. How many of you know where to find that data on our website? All right, hence the need for this project. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, any questions or comments for Dr. Cogstaff? Justin Bagley. I appreciate it, Eric. Um, great presentation. I was looking at the um, regional crash data inventory section. A question at the city we get a lot is about scooter safety, and there's quite a bit in the vulnerable road user definitions around bikes, peds, and motorcycles. Do you know if they're classified in there independently, like we get that up? I know even to get our own scooter safety information, we have to go to uh, Denver Police Department, and they do have that information, but I'm just curious if it's identifiable in this data set, something we could query out so we could get our... Yeah, that's a great question. They are listed, if I'm remembering correctly, as a non-motorist, but there's a couple different categories, and it depends on the, the CCs of the electric scooter, and so certain, I think it's below 50, 50 CCs, it's considered a different category than over that. And so, but they, I think they are all considered a non-motorist, and this should be, that is, I know, available in the kind of the raw CDOT data that municipalities should be able to request access to. Um, it's, it's redacted for certain things. There's a personal information that's removed, but those fields are in there. Justin Schmidt. Hey, Eric, I just wanted to start by saying, you know, I think we, we do a lot of Vision Zero plans, right, everybody, and we always talk about how we need to look at crash data more and figure it out. We never have time to dig into it, so I agree. I think you, Dr. Cog really taking this time and effort is incredibly valuable. Um, and as you look at kind of where you're going, I guess I know this is grant-funded and, and sort of a final report in September, but do you see this continuing at the region or recreating itself, or how does that conversation kind of continue beyond that time frame? Uh, yes, so, yeah, thank you for that. Um, ideally, this work will continue um, after the end of this grant period. Uh, we have a, a few things in the works that are we're trying to continue this um, that we're just kind of waiting to hear back on and, and a few things. But even even if those other avenues maybe don't, don't work, I think that it's a really important task. And I, and I hope that, the hope is that whatever we lay out here in the final report is actionable and that can be taken upon by municipalities, by counties, by Dr. Cog, by CDOT, whoever has a, a hand in this. Um, and also just hoping again to kind of inform the work of whether that's our regional visions or working group. Um, we work, I work very closely with our safety planner, Emily Kleinfelter. Um, and so the work that she does, um, we're hoping that if we can improve trash data, you know, obviously that improves the work of her group and improves the work of everybody here. So a couple of different avenues that we can continue this even past the end of that official final federal year. You said yeah. our support in that, so yeah, that's great. Thank you. And I don't mind getting a little bit more specific, but Eric's answer was perfectly correct. Um, but a couple of very specific things I'd point out, we're really seeing value in the Regional Crash Data Consortium group itself, and we are committed to continuing that. 
um, pass this grant. Now, this grant, this grant program, this 405C grant program, is not meant to be an ongoing funding source for this work, unfortunately. Um, you know, you sort of set up a project, you test it, you pilot it, um, but you can't continue it with 405C funds. So at least some of the major pieces of the work regarding the Crash Data Consortium group itself, we will continue um, at Dr. Cog. We're also applying for a... Um, a next year kind of 405C grant, again, not for this work because we can't continue it quite in that way, but based on what we've learned and based on what Eric's presented today, we've identified kind of a cluster of sort of pilot projects um, or a pilot framework that we want to test regarding um, kind of aggregating the processing of crash data. Um, so we'll see. I don't want to get too much into a grant that hasn't been approved yet, but the idea is that we're uh, applying forward with a grant that we could at least carry on a specific element of the work over the next year. Thank you. Thank you for Dr. Cog's effort to work on this um, really important project to improve how we collect, analyze, and, and process this data and share it across agencies. So appreciate the efforts by Dr. Cog. Thank you. Move on to item number eight, discussion items. Uh, climate Pollution Reduction Grant Program, attachment F in your packet. And I'll hand it to Robert Spots, Mobility Analytics Program Manager, for this particular item. Hello, all. Um, thanks for having us. Robert Spots, uh, Mobility Analytics Program Manager with the Denver Regional Council of Governments. Uh, we're here to talk another, about another grant program that we have this opportunity now and we'd like to keep going. I'm going to turn it over to Maddie Nesbitt, who's hired under the grant, and she'll discuss um, what this grant is and where we're at right now. All right. Hi, everyone. So just real quick, today we're going to be talking about the Climate Pollution Reduction Grant. Um, talking about the Priority Climate Action Plan, Comprehensive Climate Action Plan, um, and then the very exciting um, Implementation Grant. So for those of you who are not familiar, the Climate Pollution Reduction Grant, also known as CPRG, um, is a $5 billion funded um, through the Inflation Reduction Act, and it is administered by the EPA. Um, $250 million of that is for planning, with about $1 million going to 70 of the largest metro areas in the country, and $3 million to roughly each state, and then $4.6 billion is then left over for the implementation grants. So Dr. Cog was, of course, awarded the $1 million planning grant, hence why I'm standing before you right now. Um, and we also, with that money, were able to hire Lotus Engineering and Sustainability, um, who's a local consultant here in Denver, for all of our technical work and the vast majority of our public engagement work as well. So just a quick kind of high overview of what the EPA is requiring um, for us is the Priority Climate Action Plan, which was due last month. The Comprehensive Climate Action Plan, which Robert will discuss more, um, is due in August of next year. And then finally, that status report is due in August of 2027. So this is just a map of the Climate Pollution Reduction Planning Grant area, and it covers 12 counties. All right, super excited to speak about this today to you all. Um, so our PCAP had various elements, some of it required, some of it not. Um, but what ours did um, include was a public and stakeholder engagement, a regional greenhouse gas inventory, which was completed by Lotus Engineering and Sustainability, a low income and disadvantaged communities, also known as LIDAC benefits analysis, a greenhouse gas reduction strategies, ours has eight. Um, and then the quantification of those greenhouse gas reductions, the review of authority to implement, um, and finally, workforce planning analysis. And something I want to note about that that, I'm, that we're pretty passionate about here is we did not need to include that, but we chose to. Um, so we did something I think that's really important to understand about this project is obviously we did have guidance, but the EPA kind of said, like, here's some high-level stuff um, and run with it. And something I really want to emphasize in that you can see um, the PCAP is public, it is on our website, is we did extensive public and stakeholder engagement. We knew that the success of this plan kind of was held within our community um, and the nonprofits, CBOs, everyone who contributed to this. So this is a high level, but this was all done in like six months. 
Um, so I think that makes our plan really strong. Um, but anyway, so we have monthly stakeholder steering committee uh, meetings every month. There's about 40 to 60 local government staff that attend that. Um, and we also have a focus support from a project management team, which is comprised of about half a dozen uh, experts in the region, varying from electrification, sustainability, climate work, um, and they have been um, instrumental to the success of the PCAP. We also have an equity subcommittee, which is comprised of leaders representing CBOs um, across the region, and they were in like every step of the way with us. We took all of their considerations in. Um, they were definitely the all-stars of the group, I would say. We had two virtual public meetings. The first one, which was in late fall, was just to inform the public of this project, um, kind of a once in a lifetime opportunity. So we had a really good turnout for that. And then the second we had um, was to solicit feedback on the priority climate action plan itself. We had a social pinpoint, which was our public engagement website. We had over 50 comments, um, which is really wonderful to see from all kinds of, of different people in our community. We coordinated heavily with the Colorado Energy Office. Um, one thing to note is they also submitted a grant for CPRG, so we made sure to carefully collaborate and work with them whenever possible. And finally, we had so many, so many wonderful dozens, dozens and dozens of meetings with individual stakeholders and nonprofit groups. So we, Lotus um, did an amazing job on this. They conducted our regional greenhouse gas inventory, and this is for 2022 using AR5 global warming potential. Um, so what that looks like is 43.7 million metric tons of CO2 per year. Um, as many of you probably know in this room, the vast majority, and it kind of looks like this across the country, um, is from buildings and transportation. But you'll see how this plays into our PCAP. So for our final measures, we had eight in total. We, there was no minimum, no maximum requirement. There were seven different categories you could choose from, agriculture, um, waste management, buildings, transportation, but the, the key thing there to know is it had to fall within one of those categories. So what ended up working out with us and what our stakeholders showed that they felt most strongly about was around buildings and transportation. So what we did here is we had two supportive measures, we wanted to call that. So they, what, what, what we mean by that is it didn't necessarily directly impact greenhouse gas reduction, but we saw them as requirements for success, I would say. So one of those being that workforce planning. Um, we wrote in our PCAP that um, a lot of funds would be needed. Um, we're nothing without our workforce, specifically our green workforce. So that was something we added into our PCAP as well as having a kind of one-stop shop for buildings. So let's say you're a homeowner and you want to electrify or weatherize your home. Um, you would come to this kind of one-stop shop body and then they would help you navigate through those things. Um, next, we had four building measures. Um, and then for those, we had MUSH, so municipality, university, school, and hospital buildings, and that would be electrifying and making those more efficient. Second one we had was a multifamily building decarbonization strategy, and that was directed towards property owners. Really hard to navigate the space. I don't know if any of you have tried to purchase a heat pump. It's very confusing. Um, so that was the intention of that one. The next one we had was a res residential um, energy audit and electrification. So kind of similar to what I just mentioned, but rather it's just for residential and, how, and helping people navigate that space. And finally, another option we had was free home weatherization and energy audits for specifically the identified low income and disadvantaged community tracks. And that is identified through the EPA. And then finally, we had two transportation ones that was tied to expanding bus rapid transit in LIDAC population areas. And then the second one was expanding active transportation. One other thing to note, some of you might be thinking these seem, they overlap intentionally. Something that was very clear to us from the EPA was that if you, whatever you wrote in the PCAP, in order to write an implementation grant, it had to be in either your state or let's say your Dr. Cog's PCAP. And if it was not, you could not qualify. So if you forgot to add a piece in your PCAP, you cannot have that in your grant. So that's why there's intentional overlap here. And um, we wanted to make sure we didn't miss anything um, because if you do, it could disqualify your implementation grant. Um, I'm thrilled to say we did submit our PCAP um, per the Dr. Cog board approval um, in February of 2024. We were the first one in EPA region eight to, to do so. Um, and yeah, it was very exciting. 
and I will hand it off to Robert to talk about the Comprehensive Climate Action Plan. Thank you, Maddie. So that was a real sprint there. Um, this is our first time coming to you, even though this program has been going on for about six months. We've been engaging with the board, but it was, it was an incredibly short timeline put on us by the EPA. Um, so this is the second product that we are going to create, a planning product, uh, the Comprehensive Climate Action Plan. And we have a little more time to breathe. We can step back and kind of look at this a little bit more holistically. We've knocked out a pretty good chunk of the requirements, at least partially, but we have some additional ones. Uh, we have to do projections for um, all sectors out through our horizon year 2050, as well as greenhouse gas uh, emission reduction targets that we'd like to see, as well as a bunch more um, greenhouse gas uh, reduction strategies. But in the context of Dr. Cog, I think um, the Priority Climate Action Plan was really focused on these implementation grants, which I'll talk about in just a second. There's no more carrots or sticks, really, in this program. We have this, these, this money. We have um, Maddie for hopefully three and a half years and beyond, and we have some more consultant budget. But we're kind of taking a step back and, like, wh what could this plan be that would actually be useful, not kind of replicating what's already in the local um, government's plans? What is the role of Dr. Cog or a regional agency in this space? Obviously, a lot of the emission generators are regional in nature. Um, waste and transportation being kind of the easiest um, ones to identify. But there's also been just a really outpouring of support from all of your local communities. They've all participated in this program and just poured their hearts into it. Um, so how can we kind of coalesce that energy and make a plan that's actually useful and, and that we can actually work on implementing? Obviously, identifying funding is the biggest challenge. Um, but Dr. Cog has a lot of other hats we wear, including just getting folks together around the table to share best practices and, and, and policy expertise. So we're, we're kind of looking at it in a similar way that maybe Metrovision is, where it's kind of a guiding document. Um, how can we use this opportunity and these resources we have for this next three years to make something valuable to our communities? Eager to have feedback from um, your communities as we proceed. If you are interested in getting involved in any way, we do hold stakeholder meetings the first Tuesday of every month. Um, easy to get on the email list. We're always looking for ways to amplify our, our public engagement, and please feel free to reach out with us to, to us at any time with any ideas um, for uh, anything involved with this plan. And throw Maddie's hat in there. <laughs> um, so I'm going to kind of step back. Uh, as, as Maddie mentioned, the Priority Climate Action Plan really did focus on buildings and transportation. Uh, there's a lot of money and availability for transportation that Dr. Carg is already involved in. But there um, was a really focused group of stakeholders um, kind of stemming from a group called the Front Range Beneficial Electrification Network. That have, um, working under Excel's Partners in Energy, they, they recognize that 52% of our end use emissions do come from buildings. And so they saw this opportunity uh, as a really good place to seek funding to tackle that issue in our region. So when it, when it came to time to look at implementation grants from around the region, all local governments were eligible. Um, but the regional partners really felt like it was Dr. Cog's base to kind of consolidate that effort. They recognized that the building problem is regional in nature more than local. Things like workforce and industry and the contractors all work regionally, right? They cross boundaries. So some folks got together here and um, asked Dr. Cog to submit this application on, the, on behalf of the locals. So on January 17th of this year, we brought this to our board, um, presented the concept, and the board voted unanimously for Dr. Cog to pursue uh, this grant opportunity with the support of our local governments. It was a full-time job for several of our local government staff for a couple months. We were inundated. It was a, it was a really intensive grant, 25 pages of just the work plan, 10 pages of technical and budget appendices. Uh, had a consultant for grant writing provided by Denver. Con technical consultant Lotus was hired to do the technical work. So it was a really extensive effort um, for a couple months. We're very happy that we got it submitted on April 1st. But essentially what it is, it's, it's, a, it's an ambitious and comprehensive um, look at addressing this sector, the building sector, and decarbonizing it while serving our LIDAC communities. The grant we're going for was a pretty big swing, $199.7 million for a five-year program. It's a really significant increase in funds for Dr. Cog. If we get it, it would require up to 15 new staff to operate. Five of those would just be kind of administration and financing. 
staff to help just monitor and 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 report on the progress of this to EPA. So high level, there's four measures here um, in line with the Justice 40 initiative, as well as to provide kind of guaranteed work as this new industry is developing. Almost 50 million of it would go to free um, home retrofits and upgrade services to um, low income and disadvantaged community residents. Um, 17.4 million would be energy advising, so that's folks that would enter your home, do an evaluation of what your home would need to decarbonize, including retrofits and, and the available rebates, a list of contractors, eventual costs, um, to because right now basically the, the contractors, the folks doing this work are not fully prepared for this the shift, and so these, these advisors could create a real plan that would work for your home. There'd be a uh, 43 million is rebates and incentives. So there's already kind of a really complicated network of local, state, and federal rebates um, that will help the upfront costs of these installations. We're hoping this would be the cherry on the cake that would really bring cost parity to replacing um, a furnace or water heater with a heat pump. And then a policy coll co collaborative, and that's where we see a lot of the bang for the buck. Um, this, this, these funds, the $40 million roughly would, first of all, provide that opportunity to um, hire a facilitator to bring folks interested in updating policies and building codes and building performance standards to a table, to the table and, and working together on that, as well as um, sub-allocating funds to local governments so that they could either develop new programs such as building performance standards, update their building codes, or just additional capacity for permitting and inspection um, so that this product can get out into their communities. And these are, um, again, standing on the pillars of two of three actually really important support initiatives. So that's commu community engagement, hearing back from the community, what's working and what's not, and how we should implement this program, a comprehensive advertising and communication strategy, first of all, to kind of just inform, there's not very much education out there right now about what heat pumps are and how, how, how they've grown so much over the last decade in terms of their efficiency and in especially in cold weather climates like ours, um, as well as, as advertising the program, the rebates available, and getting folks interested in the product. And finally, a big big chunk of this is workforce and industry engagement. So everything from ups, upscaling existing workforce, training new entrants to the workforce, working with um, local universities and trade schools, and then um, even in innovation funds. So in, it let it, allowing the in a, industry to innovate and providing them with um, incentive to do so. So there's kind of I've gone through it all, but there's how the budget winds up at 199.7. I'll, I'll just, in case there's any questions, we decided the grant was, you could apply it in tiers of funding and we opted to stay within the 100 to $200 million tier. We didn't go above um, with the big fish from 200 to $500 million, but we stayed right below. So we are in tier, which is why it, we wound up at that kind of odd number. As mentioned, the grant was submitted on April 1st. We are anxiously waiting uh, until sometime in July to hear out here if, if we were awarded the funding. And then it is a drawdown grant, fortunately, because floating that much money is pretty tough, but the, 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 the big pot of money would come in October uh, if we were. And with that, we can take questions on anything, the planning or the grant. Thank you for that overview, Robert and Maddie. Appreciate that. Any questions or comments for Dr. Cogstaff? Matt Mormon. Um, on your first two, how do you envision the transportation improvement? Is this a separate, totally? If we were awarded the grant, it'd be totally separate from the TIP. The TIP is only transportation. For the, for the implementation grant, but what about this plan that you've developed? Okay. It's it's also separate, yeah. Not not FHWA funds and not. Curious if the green item would carry. On top store. Thank you. Just, just to expand, Robert's correct. Very different funding pot, federal agency oversight. However, we're we're certainly taking steps to coordinate sort of the the. Uh, priority climate action plan and the comp and specifically the comprehensive climate action plan work with the regional housing assessment housing strategy it'll help inform 
in some ways our next update to the regional transportation plan, all of these things are certainly connected. So while we don't have to include sort of the climate pollution reduction program planning effort into sort of the UPWP or the TIP or the regional transportation plan, we're working on how we integrate how those efforts inform each other and how they, how they work together. Rick Pilgrim. So uh, Rick Pilgrim, environmental interest. Ron, to follow up on that, it, it, or Robert uh, or Maddie, are there um, metrics to show performance over some period of time? In terms of the, the climate pollution reduction measures? Yeah, um, so we are, it, there's a lot of modeling happening right now. So we, right now we mostly have just our inventory. The projections weren't included. The concept is that we develop projections for like a baseline scenario, right? We're not to implement these. And then there are projections for currently the, the two sectors we've addressed, buildings and transportation. So we've seen if we kind of reach these really um, aggressive goals where we could get in those two sectors. So yes, there are projections. The biggest issue is how to identify the funding, especially as a regional agency, we can't levy a sales tax or something like that, like a local government could. So the projections look a lot different whether we, <laughs> for whether we get this grant or not. Um, but we do identify the strategies and how far they could go. Those are identified in the Priority Climate Action Plan, which is linked. Okay, I'm a little, uh, um, I followed that, but I'm a little dense. Um, Rebates and incentives, 43 million. Funds to mitigate costs, of accelerate adoption, spur market growth. Um, th does that mean if I have a building and I uh, am interested in a rebate and an incentive to modify the building, that there's there's a or there's a program here that I could apply for? Uh, yeah. So if we if we get funded, right. uh, we'll, we'll hear in July. Yeah. So there's, there's kind of this, the blueprint for this program established through that grant app, kind of highly described here. If we get the, the funds, there's gonna be, I think we're talking about developing like five kind of working groups as well as kind of an official advisory body similar to a TAC or something that would you know, make official fiduciary decisions of that nature. But there's a lot of decisions to be made about how to allocate the specific monies within each of those pools. So oh, how, how big should the rebate be on a residential heat pump, for example? We already know there's this complicated landscape of, again, federal state utility grants. What is that threshold where we get the most bang for our buck, but still incentivize folks to, to make that transition to a heat pump, right? So, but there's similar decisions happening in kind of all of those groups, really complicated decisions. That, did that answer your question or I'm missing you? Oh yeah, I know. Well, I mean, y yes and no. The uh, uh, I, c I can see that the logistics of how do you allocate or or make money, make the dollars available for uh, you know deserving programs um, at a at a municipality or a county level. That that sounds like it's going to get complicated. So. The, the, the money allocation is one way, uh, but then the other is, okay, uh, we're able to um, make improvements to a, a house or a building, and so then I, I guess we would understand that that, in general, has an X value impact to the environment. Yeah, yeah, we, we do have that all modeled in the technical appendix of Okay. Yeah, so I mean, the, the, the relatively new to this space, you've mostly seen me as a transportation planner here, but the step one is building weatherization, right? And that goes for any building. The second you do that, you reduce the energy costs, whether you're burning natural gas or electricity. So that's, that's the, the starting place. After that, once you move to electrification, you're no longer necessarily burning natural gas. Now, obviously the power plants are doing that, but their, their power generation is getting cleaner and cleaner and cleaner every day. As we move further down, a fully electrified, weatherized, building is very efficient and is at zero because all of the energy produced could be solar panels on top of your house too are producing zero greenhouse emissions. 
so all of that is the, the grid mix, everything is all modeled. I didn't do that modeling work myself, but the emissions are quite substantial. Again, it's 52% of our um, emissions right now are coming from buildings. So I, it's really, especially, especially once we get to 2050, the emissions are, emissions are really significant. Thanks. Jack McAllison. Thank you, uh, Maddie and Robert, for the really interesting and it holds a lot for our future, I think. Uh, question for uh, for Ron. Um, talked about a little bit, I think, in, in questioning. Relationship with greenhouse your tip, the tip and area and the policy and with that. We talked a little bit about Metro Vision on the bill interested in possibilities or tracks that that could hold in the future probably get to be devolved and, and established for all of us to think about. And then as a, as a follow-up, I, as I recall, in CDOT in the in the Bill 21, CDOT had a, there was a uh, to develop a methodology means for forecasting or projecting greenhouse gas. Quantities, budget perspective, estimating a relationship with that back to this effort. Thanks, Mac. Uh, Ron Papsworth, Dr. Cog. Um, I may have put a lot of Senate Bill 260 out of mind um, to try to make room for all of the more recent legislative conversations have been going on, so apologies for not exactly remembering what you're referring to. I'll try to go back and refresh my memory. Um, I, I think in, in relation to the, the main part of your question, Mac, um, still a lot to come, right? So we've got to, we've got to finish up the, the comprehensive climate action plan. We will kick off later this year the major update to our regional transportation plan. All of that will lead up to and will happen before we launch into really significant conversations and particularly adopting sort of the policy framework for the next transportation improvement program process. And I can't believe y'all are ready to start talking about the next tip process when we just finished the last one, which was a boatload of work. Thank you, Todd and Josh. Um, but I think the point is we're going to let some of those other things sort of marinate and mature um, to, to kind of inform our next conversations with all of you, all of our member governments, our stakeholders, and, and our board around sort of how we translate this, that work, this work, the regional housing strategy, anything that comes out of this legislative session, and the beginning part of the regional transportation plan update to, to help inform sort of that, that tip, next tip framework. So we've got a little bit of ways to go, but we are, we're keeping track of all this stuff and it, it definitely is integrated and will and should inform that next tip cycle. I'll try to, I'll try and answer on the Senate Bill 260 piece of it and look to Ron and Robert to help me out. Remember that Senate Bill 260 was really based on the Colorado Greenhouse Gas Roadmap. I think I have that title correctly, which was a sector-based analysis of greenhouse gas emissions across our entire economy, right? Not just transportation. But for the transportation piece of it, and particularly the greenhouse gas rule um, that we've been occupied with for the past year and a half or so is about surface transportation. This work, and now I'm going to look at Robert and the Priority Climate Action Plan, is actually, well, first let me back up. In Senate Bill 260, that's all sort of a future-based, model-based, forecast-based for greenhouse gas emissions. In this work, correct me if I'm wrong, Robert, this is actually estimating at the more granular, granular level um, actual greenhouse gas emissions. And so the ratios and the proportions are different. The concepts are generally the same. Is that fair, Robert? Yeah, I think that's right. You know, again, it's, this is looking at the entire universe of greenhouse gas emissions in our um, area, and it's tough, right? But we do our best to do an emissions inventory. Many of you all have your own emissions inventories as well. So collected from a huge variety of sources and kind of aggregated into what we are at today. And the goal is obviously to get that much smaller kind of through modeling. So I, I, I think there was mention of 
Steve probably knows, but there was the new bill was about fuel sales rather than modeling, right? But the federal, that's just the federal greenhouse gas performance measures. Otherwise, I think it's, it's just modeling. Thank you for that. Additional questions or comments for Dr. Cog? Really appreciate that update, Maddie and Robert, and this great work by the team and kind of, you know, stretching our wings here to expand beyond transportation to commercial and residential buildings. And good luck on the grant. We look forward to hearing from you in July. And that concludes our discussion items. Um, informational items, we have two of them. This is the Multimodal Project Discussionary Grant, as well as the Safe Streets and Roads for All Grant. Um, there's information available in your packet. But I don't know, Jacob, did you want to say a few words about Yeah, them? I'll say okay. a couple words about them. Thank you, Chair Grant. So as has been our practice for the past year or two, whenever there is a major bipartisan infrastructure law discretionary grant program, uh, notice a funding opportunity or NOFO, um, and there are now several out, um, including for these two programs. We have made it a practice to ask applicants or potential applicants under these NOFOs to submit a project application, excuse me, project information form to us, um, really for transparency and regional coordination, just so that you all can be aware of what your neighbors and colleagues and other stakeholders are thinking in terms of um, potential grant applications under these programs. Um, so this month, as Chair Grant alluded to, we have two of them, the Multimodal Project Discretionary Grant, um, and we have those project information forms in the packet. I believe there are seven forms from three agencies. I think I got that right, yep. And then under Safe Streets and Roads for All, um, there are um, two project information forms, including from ourselves. Uh, we fill out our own forms. As we ask you to do, we are intending to apply for an implementation grant um, under the SS4A program. So again, these are just for information. We're not sort of debating the merits of the projects, potential projects or applications, but again, for regional transparency and coordination, uh, we do want you to see them um, and, and sort of you know, be able to coordinate and understand what your neighbors and partners are thinking, so. Thank you, Jacob. Are there any questions or comments about these two grant opportunities? Yeah, um, Jacob, um, <clears throat> on the grant you're going after, all <clears throat> like 25 million. Um, did you have more projects you can submit? Or you have to cut some projects in order to stay. Yeah, so for our SS4A implementation grant, it is a project-based grant, um, hence the, you know, the implementation. So we have done a solicitation um, across the region. You all received um, a solicitation to fill out a um, LOI, letter of interest, uh, for potential projects that we would gather, um, particularly projects for which you, frankly, could provide local match, because uh, that is an important part of the grant program. Um, but what we're trying to do is identify those really strategic uh, really competitive safety projects across the region um, that we can bundle together into an implementation grant um, under this program. So Art had a little trouble hearing you. I think if your question was, is there room for another project? I'm honestly not sure. Let's talk offline. Uh, we did receive more in LOI requests and I think we felt like we could make available in the grant, but we've been sifting through uh, those potential projects and kind of working with those. So. Let's talk sort of ASAP offline if you've got. No, I wasn't uh, thinking of adding another. I was okay. just wondering if the number of projects that you have um, are going to exceed the 25 million. We are, so the number of projects that we initially them. received, the kind of potential projects, uh, we did work and sort through those to kind of winnow those down just a little bit. Um, so now I think we're to the stage where we're kind of finalizing the projects we're going to submit. Um, so yes, we did we did receive initially more, and that's okay. We wanted people's best ideas. We did initially receive more than probably we could have submitted for, and we're working those down. Does that answer your question, Art? Yes. Thank you. Any additional questions or comments about either of these two opportunities? I just want to say thank you to Dr. Cog for um, really thinking outside the box for the Safe Streets Roads for All grant opportunity, and particularly to help uh, agencies that don't quite have their safety plan together yet, because you're not allowed to apply to, unless you have a plan. So really appreciate thinking outside the box, and perhaps lots of uh, projects can be 
um, deployed here in the Denver region. Okay, we'll move on to our final item, administrative items, uh, member comments and other matters. Uh, first up is the Advanced Mobility Partnership Working Group update. Carson Priest, do you have an update for the group? Uh, I do, Madam Chair. I'll keep it brief. Um, thank you. Uh, the Advanced Mobility Partnership Working Group met virtually early, earlier this month uh, where we heard a couple of informational briefings, first from RTD about their Accelerating Innovation Mobility Demonstration Project, uh, and then again from CDOT regarding their Digital Mobility Hub efforts. Both of these were kind of presentations focused on mobility as a service efforts at both of those agencies. Um, that's all I have, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Carson, for that update. Any additional comments or other matters from TAC members or alternates? Jacob has another. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> the Jacob show. Promise I'm almost done, but one more very important thing. Um, so as part of our non-discrimination plans work that Alvin Badal Sanchez presented on earlier, one of the things we're actually required to do under Title VI is to do a demographic survey um, of our transportation committee, so this committee, uh, Transportation Advisory Committee. We know we've sent you a lot of emails, so we were holding off until this meeting and until we could present to you, but we are going to send you an email um, to members and alternates asking you to fill out a demographic survey. It is completely voluntary. Uh, we did this a year ago, so we'll be doing it again. Um, the survey will be due May 8th, um, and we're planning to send it out this afternoon. So just, just a heads up that it's coming. It is voluntary, but it does help us in our compliance efforts under uh, federal requirements under Title VI. Thank you, Chair Grant. Thank you, Jacob. Bill Soroy? Um, just wanted to let everybody know that we will be um, coming out with our call for projects this week for the partnership program. So those of you who are been talking about projects, um, John Gardaki is our contact, but um, I think the expectation is, I think on, on the first, it's supposed to come out. For that update, Bill. Additional updates or comments or other matters? Art Griffith? Bill, but with, with the amount, do you think that you're gonna let it's going to be, it'll be $2 million, but $2 million a year for three years, so up to, and the way it works is it's going to be a maximum of, uh, or, yeah, maximum of 30% to any one sub-regional service council. Okay, anything else? Seeing none. Our next meeting will be May 20th, 2024. If you did not sign in, please do check in at the sign-in table or with Dr. Cog's staff to be sure you're registered as attending. Thank you for your participation today. And our next meeting again will be May 20th. Thank you. Oh, we are now concluded at 3.07. Thank you.